All righty. So good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the last day of the very first National Biochar Week. And a huge thanks to all those that have volunteered an enormous amount of hours to put this buffet of biochar education on. Much appreciated. As some of you may know, I wear a variety of hats in the biochar world, which allows me to see the industry from many different perspectives, from local to state to national and international, and from both the academic and commercial side. That said, I have a disclaimer or two about this topic that I'm about to present. I am far from an expert on carbon markets. And in fact, until a few years ago, was not really convinced that carbon markets would make a huge difference to the biochar industry. I was wrong, or at least I think I was wrong. And hopefully this presentation will show you why. Although I've spent many hours attempting to educate myself about carbon markets, it's a complex and quickly changing landscape, but one that I feel has the potential to finance the kind of scale up needed to curb the Keeling curve and get global warming under control. Disclaimer number two is the thinking and opinions presented here are my own and do not necessarily represent the opinions of IBI. What I thought I'd discover, what I'd cover today is at a very high level is a brief history of how biochar um, has interacted with the carbon markets, the difference between offsets and removals, a discussion on where biochar stands today in terms of the carbon markets and where I think it's headed in the short term. The history of biochar in the carbon markets is really less than a decade old. As many of you may know, the International Biochar Initiative invested much time and talent into drafting a biochar methodology for the American Carbon Registry, and that was delivered back in 2014. Ultimately, the methodology was not accepted. At the time, there was pushback on the topic of permanence of biochar in soils. When weighed against the permanence of carbon in forests or soils, this type of comment to me seems a little bit biased. <laughs> but to be fair, biochar was practically unknown to the vast majority of climate wonks and some of the hype around biochar can be a little off-putting to scientists, I have learned. <laughs> All of this though began to change after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report was published in October of 2018. That report stated for the very first time that reducing emissions alone was not going to cut it. If we're to stay below 1.5 C of warming, and by the way, we're already at 1.1, significant amounts of atmospheric carbon needs to be withdrawn. The report went on to highlight a half a dozen negative emissions technologies that they believed were capable of materially rebalancing atmospheric carbon. Though they provided estimates for each type of negative emissions technology, there was not enough discussion on economic viability, co-benefits, risks, or permanence. Still, it was a really good thing for the biochar industry, even though they capped the annual sequestration capacity for biochar at 1.8 gigatons. I think that was largely because they only focused on the use of biochar use in agricultural soils. And as Albert Bates and I pointed out in Bern, we believe that number could be significantly higher. In the spring of 2019, Puro, a small startup in Finland, launched a series of pilot carbon removal auctions, which included biochar. It was so successful, they launched a business which now reaches far beyond Finland and provides on-demand purchasing of carbon removal products. In 2020, the European Biochar Consortium, in collaboration with the Ithaca Institute, developed and debuted the EBC C-Sync methodology. In parallel, a new blockchain carbon marketplace solely focused on biochar was developed by Carbon Future. More on all of this in a few minutes. So for those of you that might not know, there are two broad categories of mitigation strategies, reducing or avoiding greenhouse gases and sequestering carbon. Until recently, both of these strategies were kind of blended under the carbon offset nomenclature, but that's beginning to change perhaps because of the IPCC report, which explicitly stated that both were needed. Carbon offsets are all about reducing the amount of greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere. There are a wide variety of projects 
that qualify as an offset. And to name just a few, in agriculture, you can change your manure management strategies or you can convert to no-till. In the energy sector, sector, it's all about switching from fossil fuels to solar, wind, hydro, geothermal. In transportation, uh, it's about improving fuel efficiency or electrification. And in waste disposal, it's about capturing methane from landfills and wastewater treatment plants instead of letting it go to the air. There are many more. According to a recent World Bank publication on the state and trends of carbon pricing in 2020, current carbon prices range from less than $1 per ton of CO2 equivalent to $119 per ton, with almost half of the covered emissions priced at less than $10 a ton. Even with these low prices, $45 billion was raised in carbon pricing revenues in 2019. Individuals can now go to businesses such as TerraPass or Carbon Markets Inc. and buy a ton of offsets for a mere $9 to $11 per ton. That means the average American can offset their annual carbon footprint for less than $200. To me, this seems a little bit like magical thinking. Carbon removals, on the other hand, are all about pulling carbon out of the atmosphere or about preventing carbon from converting back into carbon dioxide and going back to the atmosphere what I like to call carbon interruptus. Sometimes these strategies are called CDR for carbon dioxide removals, or as the IPCC calls them, negative emissions technologies. I would just like to clarify something which I often hear a lot of folks in the biochar industry claim, and that is that biochar pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere. Biochar uh, does not actually pull carbon out of the atmosphere unless it's in cement, which I've recently learned it can do that. Plants and planktons do that. Pyrolyzing plants or plankton prevents carbon from turning back into uh, carbon dioxide. Both are necessary, but I do think it behooves us to be a little bit more precise when we talk about how biochar fits into the carbon cycle. So increasingly people are categorizing removals into either nature-based solutions or technological solutions. The landscape though, as I said, for removals is much smaller than for offsets, but I hope it will grow. This graphic shows some of the current removal product categories. And I added uh, stars next to the ones that were called out in the IPCC report. So I'm just gonna cover a few of them here. Um, planting new forests or restocking old forests has traditionally been categorized as an offset, but they are in fact one of the best ways to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The downside, as we are increasingly witnessing, is that forests are not nearly as permanent as we would like them to be. Moving forward, forests are likely to be even more precarious with increased drought and temperatures, not to mention the increasing onslaught of pests and diseases. Soil carbon has more recently been added to certain carbon removal marketplaces, such as Nori and Indigo Ag developed a methodology as well. On the technology side, some of the proffered solutions are currently available, while others are still at demonstration scale or not even ready for demonstration. So my limited understanding of enhanced weathering is that it involves crushing rocks to boost their chemical weathering capabilities, which then allows them to absorb CO2. That sounds likely to be expensive and it's still in the testing phase. And so it's not yet available on any carbon markets. Direct air capture and carbon sequestration or DAX is happening and is in fact attracting enormous amounts of money. You can buy removal credits directly from at least one company in the industry, Climeworks out of Switzerland. Unfortunately, it comes at a pretty hefty freight price tag, somewhere north of $600 per ton. Also finding safe large voids into which carbon dioxide can be injected that are conveniently located to where the CO2 is being harvested can prove challenging. Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or BEX has similar challenges as CO2 is also injected into the earth's voids as a means of preventing it from returning to the atmosphere. Pyrolysis with carbon capture and sequestration or PICS is also a capture and storage technology. It's not on here because nobody knows about it, but what's being captured here is bio oil and not CO2. If the bio oil is used in, for example, asphalt or even injected into deep wells, which I just heard this week has been done in Europe, it can be considered as a removal product. As some bio oils may contain up to 80% carbon, 
the carbon sequestration potential is huge, though using bio oil to displace fossil fuels might make more sense in the short term. My mantra when it comes to biochar and carbon removal is that it is safe, scalable, and shovel ready. This lens should be used to assess all CDR technologies, at least in the short term, as we have limited funds, limited time, and ultimately we do not wanna cause more harm than good. Although it may seem like I'm pitting biochar against the other CDRs, that's not my intent at all. We need all of them and more, but we do need to be mindful of the economics as funds are limited, and we need to understand the potential environmental impacts, co-benefits, or negative impacts. As I mentioned earlier, the first carbon removal marketplace to accept biochar was Puro. The coin of the realm at Puro is called a cork, which stands for CO2 removal certificate. Puro currently has three different types of removal products, biochar, wood or cellulose used in construction, and something called carbonated building materials, which to be honest, uh, is still a little unclear to me. The first biochar producer to go through the certification process and sell biochar corks was Carbofex, a Finnish biochar technology company. If any of you joined us last year for the IBI study tour, you would have met Sampo, the CEO of Carbofex, as well as the folks from Poro. I spoke with Sampo earlier this week to ask him about his experience and said he has been quite happy with how things have worked out with Puro. He'd originally hoped to get at least 30 euros per ton, and the most recent sales were more than double that. At the moment, he's completely sold out. His most recent buyer was Shopify, but there are some even more well-known brands knocking at the carbon removal gate, which we'll hear more about in 2021. An Australian biochar technology company, Rainbow Bee Eater, has also gone through the certification process and sold corks on Puro's marketplace. They've averaged about $75 per ton, which in their particular scenario equates to more than $200 per dry ton of biochar. This is why I say carbon markets could be a game changer for the biochar industry. The multiplier used to convert one ton of dry biochar into carbon dioxide equivalents is calculated based on emissions related to feedstock acquisition and transportation, as well as process emissions, carbon content, and a few other factors. Currently, the multiplier ranges from about 2.5 to 3.2, which is an indicator of the carbon efficiency and overall net sequestration. One thing to note about this methodology is that it only measures the carbon impact from feedstock to factory gate and does not factor in any carbon degradation over time when it's put in soils. Other carbon removal products on the Apuro website have sold at far lower prices, roughly $26 per ton. That may be because there's much more supply or it could be because of the notion of additionality, which is a whole other topic that we don't have time for today. Um, but basically it's, it's addressing the fact that um, these uh, elements would probably be used in building materials with or without carbon financing. And that's the main question that additionality seeks to address. In an effort to ensure that carbon sequestration calculation included a realistic assessment of the persistence of the carbon in biochar, once it's been deposited in soils or consumed by animals, the European Biochar Consortium and the Ithaca Institute developed and debuted the EBC C-Sync methodology earlier this year. Additional end uses for biochar, such as in concrete or asphalt, are also being vetted as a long-term carbon sequestration opportunity for biochar. So what are the costs um, to become certified? Um, they include the laboratory costs for getting your biochar characterized, and that's to ensure that the biochar produced meets the standards for both stability and safety. And then on top of that, there's a process audit fee assessed at about one euro per ton of CO2E sold. So putting my biochar, my, sorry, my IBI board chair hat on for a moment, I would just like to mention that IBI is working on expanding our current biochar for use in soils material standards so that it includes a broader perspective similar to the EBC standard, which uh, ensures that feedstock is su sustainably sourced and that there are true negative emissions and verifiable carbon sinks. The most recent platform to debut biochar as a carbon removal product 
is carbon future. They've adopted the EBCC strength methodology, but they also accept the IBI uh, standard for biochar used in standard in soils. This is the very first end-to-end -end blockchain verification system for biochar in the world. And I have to give a lot of credit to Hannes Junginger and Andreas Holtzel for investing so much time in building this platform. They've piloted the system in Europe and very recently certified the first US biochar production facility. That's Humboldt Sawmill in Santa Rosa, California. Pacific Biochar is the project developer on this and they helped shepherd the whole certification process. And they've also worked out a process whereby the biochar producer, the project developer and farmer share equally in the revenues from the carbon removal sales. This platform has a two-step verification process, which addresses both the production side and the carbon sink side, meaning a farmer or a composter must verify that they have in fact put biochar into the soil or compost. This graphic at the bottom here um, shows who uh, is currently selling on their platform. Obviously it's still small scale, but they have now gone through piloting various different types of scenarios and they are ready to scale. Uh, in terms of when it becomes financially viable for a biochar producer to participate in this particular carbon removal marketplace, it sounds like you need to be producing at least 500 tons per year to cover your costs. As with any new uh, industry, once the bravest startups have showed viability and demand for a new product or service, other companies are more inclined to jump in. We're starting to see this when it comes to biochar in the carbon markets. Vera, formerly known as VCS, is the world's largest voluntary greenhouse gas program with almost 1,700 registered projects in 80 countries. For the past few months, there have been a series of discussions about how to fund and develop a biochar methodology for the Vera platform. I'm happy to announce that just yesterday, Vera released a request for a proposal to develop a comprehensive biochar greenhouse gas accounting methodology. As part of that process, the development team will review all inactive or active methodologies and then build upon that thinking. The expected time frame to develop a methodology is for fall of 2021, which is very ambitious, and they hope to have it accepted before the end of the year. This could open up all sorts of demand for biochar credits as more than a thousand corporations that have committed to what are called science-based targets are required to purchase removal credits from globally recognized marketplaces such as Vera. Putting back on my IBI board, chat, hair, <laughs> board chair hat, um, th there's been a lot of discussion about how IBI should interact with the carbon markets. As I mentioned earlier, IBI previously took the role of methodology developer, but moving forward, we see that there are likely to be many different kinds of methodologies related to biochar. Some will focus on large scale agricultural projects, others will focus on mitigation impacts of biochar, and still others will focus on how smallholder farmers can be compensated for banking carbon in their soils. So at the moment, our approach is to work with organizations like Carbon Future and Vera and to ensure that the biochar getting carbon credits is safe and long lasting, and it's more of an advisory or support role. That said, we uh, have various volunteers working on the development of a methodology that focuses on smallholder farmers in the developing world that are using low tech biochar production methods. We're also launching a carbon advisory committee headed up by Simon Manley, who was the former CEO of Carbon Gold. Simon has been in the biochar industry for more than a decade and was probably one of the first to trial a methodology for smallholders many years ago. So if you have experience with carbon markets and would like to be considered for that committee, please reach out to me. So with that, I'll just reiterate the mantra that I think we ought to be taking to the market is that biochar is safe, scalable, and shovel ready. <laughs>